Good morning and welcome to Realize Community Church. We're going to have Pastor Rich come on up and start us off with a scripture reading and a prayer. Good morning. Today's scripture will come from the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to you today, we ask that you would, that you would impress upon our hearts your word, that you would stir in us a passion for you above all else. Father, we come today knowing that we have all like sheep gone astray. We've wandered from the path you've laid out for us, but we gather because we seek you. Lord, as we celebrate Mother's Day today and think about the impact of mothers on their children, I pray for those mothers and for fathers as well, for all of us who have the responsibility of passing on the truth of your word. Help us to be constantly talking about your truths, connecting our our everyday realities with the reality of your word, teaching our children that there is a God above us, that there is a life bigger than what we see and feel in our everyday experiences. And Father, I pray for mothers, for all parents, that they would give their children a reason to want to choose Christ. Father, teach us Even in these moments as we gather to sing and to study your word and to pray, teach us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. These things we pray in the name of your son Jesus, who demonstrated such love for us. Amen. Just a couple of important announcements. If you're uh, watching us on Facebook, don't forget to share the video or create a watch party. And if you are watching through YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified when we post videos. And a reminder to parents that your junior church lessons for your kids will be posted sometime this morning so that you can share that with your kids and give them a time of learning as well. And don't forget about the meaningful moments with Mozzie that we're posting every week also. And a reminder to youth group, you have Zoom meetings on Wednesdays and Sundays. Not tonight. Not tonight. Not today because it's Mother's Day. Uh, So usually Wednesdays and Sundays at 7. So this week, just Wednesday at 7 p.m., just watch for the text with the link. And that's all I have.
Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all things. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from me. Today, as we continue in our Impact World series, we are again in Acts chapter 8. Uh, we'll be taking a little longer passage than last week. We will be reading from uh, verse 9 to verse 40. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole thing for us so that we can actually hear the text. And uh, hopefully those of you who are watching at home have your Bibles so you're able to, to track that. Um, I want to strongly encourage you whenever you are engaging uh, with the Word online or in, uh, in a church setting when eventually we get back to a normal gathering, to have your own Bible with you. So you get used to handling it. You get used to actually seeing God's Word in front of you, finding your way around. The more, just like driving around a town, the more familiar you are with it, uh, then the more comfortable you'll be. As we read from Acts Chapter 8, we'll begin with verse 9. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and had amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip... As he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived... They prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that, spe that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness, and pray to the Lord in the hope that He may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met a, an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, 
which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked? How can I, he, asked, he answered, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Father, as we open your word, I pray that you would clear away all other voices, anything that would compete in our minds and our hearts with what you have for us today. Lord, protect all who hear this now from human opinion. Guide us into a right understanding of the Scriptures by your Holy Spirit. Give us a deep desire, not only for your benefits, Lord, but for you. Teach us in these moments to see Christ as most precious, to recognize your supremacy in all things, to be filled with your Holy Spirit in such a way as to have our lives, our hearts, our very minds transformed so that we prioritize what you prioritize and we know you personally as our Lord. We give you this time for your glory. All time is yours. All glory is yours. Father, in this moment, as we set aside this short period of time to gather, although virtually, to gather together, worshiping, studying, seeking you as a family, as the body of Christ. Lord, guide us. Receive our worship today. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. As I look at this story, I'm moved. There are some things here that have caused me to struggle at times, and I had to wrestle with these. I actually confess to you that I was a little bit uh, nervous about pre preaching this passage. It took a lot of study and research for me to come to grips with a few things, and yet whenever we're studying the Word of God, we need to recognize what God is saying from beginning to end. We need to look at all passages in the context of the book that they are written, in the context of the original audience to whom they were written, in the context of the mind of the author by whom they were written, and most importantly in the context of what God is doing from creation to consummation. And as we see that in, the, in a natural reading of this text, I'm drawn to a single core reality that seems to govern the whole thing. I don't know if I can relate it as well as perhaps a much better writer than I. So I'm going to just unabashedly steal from someone smarter than me. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. 
It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. So begins Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. And as Dickens here relates, so we see in Acts 8 and in our own day a tale of two responses to the message of Christ. Call it true and false conversion, if you will. Both existing at once in extremes, intermingled yet parallel, with no middle ground. This is the picture the Holy Spirit paints through Luke's pen in the account of Philip's converts in Acts 8. The core reality that I mentioned before kind of jumps out as we look at this as a whole. It's simply this. Saving faith involves a confession of the heart, not merely a profession of the mouth. Let me say that again. I want to make sure that we grasp this. Saving faith involves a confession of the heart, not merely a profession of the mouth. Now, what does that mean? In fact, when I uh, talked to my son Gabriel about this earlier, he said, so what's the difference between confession and profession? That really is the crux of this entire message today. The difference between confession and profession, between what is actually spoken from the inner person, from the inside out, as opposed to that which is merely spoken by the mouth, professed, a creed, a statement. Saving faith is a state of the heart, not a statement of the mouth. True conversion springs from a reborn heart. As we see these things, we need to recognize that the hallmark of true conversion is inner transformation. It's not just what we say or the clothes we wear, the church we go to, the denomination we belong to, you know, how, uh, how smart we are, how cleverly we can package our faith descriptions. It's not about that. It's an in internal change, a rebirth. It's not simply an experience. As we go through this today, it is my hope and prayer that you will see the difference between a flesh-based ministry, a flesh-based so-called faith, and a spirit-based ministry and faith. We live in a world today, and I think perhaps especially in the United States, we live in a world where we are so passionate about growing the church, I would even be so generous as to say about winning souls, and perhaps that's too generous, that we work really hard to come up with human schemes and strategies and machinations to try to produce faith, to try to produce converts to try to win souls we come up with messages that tickle itching ears we work really hard to have the best live stream the best podcast the coolest band the best dressed pastor we try to do all of these things to appeal to our senses to appeal to the experience we here in america have exported the prosperity gospel around the world really a big market and I do say that with some derision the idea of the gospel is so foreign to this prosperity gospel this idea that God just wants me to be happy it is so foreign to that that it's like two completely different doctrines two different faiths it's not Christianity to say that if I get all this faith power working in me, I can do great things, I can have a great life, I can have great influence, and I will have everything go right, and my life will just be pleasant and happy. 
That's not the picture that we get in Scripture, and it's not even the picture we get in Acts chapter 8. Now, before I continue, I need to make sure that we understand both of these stories, these, this vignette of Simon Magus or Simon the Sorcerer, and also the story of this Ethiopian official, both of them come to faith in Christ, so-called, through the ministry, through the evangelism of Philip. Same guy, preaching the same gospel, the same way, ostensibly. But it's the same, the same truth about the same Messiah coming from the same mouth. And yet, two dramatically different responses. How do we get to that place? Saving faith involves a confession of the heart, not merely a profession of the mouth. Profession is to speak something forth. Confession is to speak something in agreement with, to speak something along with. In other words, to speak from the heart. When I confess something, I am acknowledging something is true. If I've committed a crime and I commit to that crime, I am confessing, I am admitting, I am acknowledging the truth of my crime, of my transgression. Professing can mean a lot of things in a lot of different contexts, but it is always the speaking forth. Very often in modern usage, we would use profess as something that indicates perhaps a level of hypocrisy. It's not necessarily so, but very often we use it in that way. I can tell you something, I can profess something and yet not actually take that to heart myself i can profess the virtues of a particular lifestyle while not living living that lifestyle i cannot confess those virtues until i make them my own this is the difference confession is speaking out what is inside profession is speaking something that i recognize and i'm familiar with but it may not actually be mine saving faith involves a confession of the heart not merely a profession of the mouth notice this receiving christ is more than just wanting his benefits and fearing judgment now, we're not going to come to Christ if we don't recognize His benefits. In fact, we're commanded in Scripture or exhorted in Scripture not to forget the Lord's benefits. It is beneficial to walk with God. We see that throughout the Old Testament. The New Testament writers echo that same thing. When you walk in the way of life, you will find that the way of life is beneficial. The wisdom books from Job through uh, Ecclesiastes are all screaming this same thing. If you follow how God has designed reality to work and you align your actions, your choices, your thoughts with what is true, what is real, and what is right, then the life that you lead will be better ultimately than if you choose to go against that. To to borrow from our passage for next week, if you kick against the goads. If you are trying to, to struggle against the way God has designed reality so that you can benefit according to your natural flesh, that's a losing game, always. Receiving Christ is more than just wanting His benefits, though. It's not simply that. There's nothing wrong with coming to Christ because you desire heaven. But at some point, we have to mature past that. We have to get past the idea that it's just what I can get from God. And it's more than just fearing judgment. There's nothing wrong with fearing judgment. We should. And it's commanded in Scripture for us to fear God. Why should we fear God? We talked about that last week. He is an omnipotent being, the omnipotent being, all-powerful. He is also holy, and we are in ourselves because of sin his adversaries his judgment and wrath are our natural state all of us according to john 3 stand condemned already that's where we start we should fear judgment we should fear god 
But at some point, we need to mature past that. So we get beyond this idea of wanting his benefits and fearing his judgment. Not that we ever stop those things, but those things become rolled into, superseded by a joyful embracing of God's grace given to us at the cross. That's what we see in this Ethiopian, as we'll talk about as we go. Receiving Christ is more than just wanting His benefits and fearing judgment. It's joyfully embracing God's grace given to us at the cross. Now, there are so many things that I really want to take us through today. We don't have time to develop them, so if there are things that that, uh, raise questions for you, then please, uh, you can send an email, you can... uh, You can... Hit us up for the podcast. You can leave If you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook, you can leave comments so we can follow up on it because we won't be able to develop everything today. But I do want us to, to really dig down on this idea. We want to hammer this home that saving faith involves a confession of the heart, not merely a profession of the mouth. What we see in these two vignettes is that you cannot, perhaps you've heard this before, judge a book by its cover. You can't judge a book by its cover. We have two covers that look very similar in this passage. And yet the book is very, very different. It occurs to me as we do this, I've said this so many times and I'll continue to say it so many times, not everyone who has a jersey is on the team. Not everyone who claims Christ belongs to Christ. And I wasn't really sure how to take this passage about Simon the sorcerer, uh, often referred to as Simon Magus. The early church fathers actually uh, saw him as the founder of what would become known as Gnosticism. In fact, when, when he refers to himself and the people acknowledge him as the great power of God, that seems to come from or, or be related to the concept of emanations called powers by the Gnostics. That there are vast emanations that reach out to God in special knowledge and special power. And there's a mysticism that goes along with that. It's a great heresy that plagued the early church and I think still has tentacles today. But as we look at these two different responses, when we get past the similar appearance of the cover to actually look at the book, there are two parallels or two contrasts that we'll be able to see here first simon knew the power of celebrity the ethiopian knew the meaning of authority there was a reason that they responded differently simon had a framework a a way of seeing life that involved having had much celebrity he had for some time As we read in in verse 9, he had for some time been going about doing this sorcery. And as he practiced his sorcery in that city, he amazed all the people of Samaria. Now that's a particularly interesting thing since the, the Samaritans also considered themselves people of God. Parallel in some ways to Israel. They were, there was great, uh, there was great, Uh, animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Samaritans believed, they they also descended from Abraham, and they believed that they worshipped the true living God. And the Jews said that they needed to worship there on, on Mount Zion. And yet, here in Samaria sorcery was being rampantly practiced and all the people were amazed by this magician this sorcerer contrary to god's explicit command that there should never be tolerated a sorcerer to live in the nation it should not ever be and yet simon had beguiled the people with his with his magic with his sorcery Simon knew the power of celebrity. The Ethiopian knew the meaning of authority. Simon had gained his notoriety through his own skills, so to speak. And as he did this, he gained power among the people. 
he became somebody, as he called himself, really important. He thought he was special because the people would follow him. We can see that same thing today. People follow celebrities all the time. We have magazines dedicated to it, all sorts of internet channels dedicated to it. There is a billion dollar, couple, many billion dollar industry dedicated simply to the influence of celebrity. So much so that we love, just love to hear people in Hollywood talk about politics and how much they know. And we love to listen. Why? Because they make movies. So they must be smart. In the same kind of a dynamic, the people of Samaria, particularly in this city, had followed Simon. He had gained a name for himself. Therefore, this became a real struggle for him when Philip came. Notice in the text, um, <clears throat> Verse 9, now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, of all the classes, all the different statuses in the, in the community, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. It appears that he called himself that, and they bought it. They followed him, notice this, they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. This celebrity gave him power. But when they believed Philip, in verse 12, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now, there's a lot to develop here and we won't get into it today, but man, I got to tell you, to see the power of the gospel. Notice, when they heard the message that he proclaimed, they believed. Now, he was also doing miraculous things, but there's an emphasis in what Luke says about the people believing that they heard this proclaimed word and they believed and were baptized. They were identified with Christ and his church. This is an important point. Simon himself, in verse 13, and the New King James Version says, then, after they believed, Simon believed. I don't know whether that's a, an accurate rendering, but in any case, we see in verse 13, Simon himself also believed and was baptized. He saw what Philip was doing, and he heard the message, and it made sense. But notice what motivated him. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Luke emphasizes the fact that the people on Mass were, were converting because of the message. Simon, and presumably many others, but, but Simon in particular, there's an emphasis that Luke makes that he is astonished by the signs and wonders. We love experiences today. We love to have demonstrative churches in fact some of the big revivalist type uh, type churches will get really caught up in in methods and we really feel like it must be the power of god when when people are demonstrating special spiritual gifts or speaking in tongues or or performing miracles or claiming to perform miracles and man that's power but the only person in this whole story whose primary focus is on the experience is Simon. Simon knew the power of celebrity. The Ethiopian knew the meaning of authority. Notice what we are told about this Ethiopian. Uh, this is in verse 27. So Philip started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake which means the queen of the Ethiopians. Other translations, depending on what you're reading, render that Candace, which is a name given or a title given like Pharaoh or Caesar uh, to the queen mother in Ethiopia. So as we think of this Ethiopian eunuch, think in terms of the, the treasury secretary. 
This is an important guy. He's with this chariot with a staff manned, manning that chariot who report to him. He understands authority. Now, when you really get authority, when, you, when you're in a position of significance, then you tend to not be overly impressed by the flash that comes along with the short timers. People come up and you'll see people come and go. As I'm, <laughs> as I'm standing here preaching, I see Rachel, our keyboardist over here, who's been a manager with Fifth Third Bank for a long time. You've seen a lot of people come and go, haven't you? A lot of hot shots who come up. And as quickly as they come, they go. They, they talk a good game. They can even perform well in the short term. But true authority is different. Real recognize real. That's what happens here. The Ethiopian eunuch is an actual authoritative person. He gets it. So he's not overly moved by powerful demonstrations or emotional experiences. So when Philip comes to him, he doesn't even need to bring signs and wonders. The Spirit prompts him to go. He goes. And he gets alongside this chariot. It's important for us to recognize his techniques here. And I, I would encourage you sometime, if you want to actually look at how to do evangelism, man, take a walk through the, through the book of Acts and see how evangelism gets done here. It's relational. It's purposeful. And it's natural. So Philip comes alongside of him, and he gets up with him, and he starts up a conversation. But it's not just, hey, how's the weather? Do you see who the Bears picked up in free agency? Instead, he comes along and he says, hey, I see, what, I see you're reading something here. Do you understand that, what you're reading? You got Isaiah the prophet in front of you? And this important Ethiopian official says, how would I know? How would I understand unless someone explains it to me? And he reads from Isaiah this passage that at the time was debated by the rabbis. Some thought maybe Isaiah was talking about himself. Some thought maybe the, the, the suffering one is Israel under God's wrath, under God's punishment. Still others thought perhaps this referred to the Messiah who would come. We have the benefit of hindsight to be able to look back and have the New Testament interpret the old for us. Simon knew the power of celebrity. The Ethiopian knew the meaning of authority. It, it impacted their lenses through which they looked at things. Simon saw Philip doing powerful things, and he wanted some of that. Wait a minute. I've been working this scene for a long time, and everybody's following me, but I can't do what this cat can do. I'm going to have to get on board and check this out. Now, I don't question whether he actually believed i think that's an important thing for us to recognize he may very well have actually believed the message but belief is not the same as faith there are a lot of people who believe that jesus christ was a real person who lived and died most of the people that you and i talk to on a regular basis most people would say they believe in god they believe in a higher power they believe in a creator or an intelligent designer seeing an increasing movement even among what had been a, a very atheistic uh, science class, science elite in our society, increasingly saying, wait a minute, the evidence points to something. I don't know if I can say God, but to, points to something. So we're seeing an, a, a basic belief that is not faith. There's a dramatic difference. The Ethiopian, on the other hand, as he saw this, he was seeking God in the scriptures, not in powerful experiences, not in emotional feelings. He was reading the scripture. And he came to terms with God as God presents himself in his word. Simon knew the power of celebrity. The Ethiopian knew the meaning of authority. Notice also another contrast between them. Simon was awed by the power of God's messengers. The Ethiopian was convicted by the truth of God's message. 
Simon was awed by the power of God's messengers. The Ethiopian was convicted by the truth of God's message. As Simon was drawn in, he, he kept on following Philip. <laughs> Matthew Henry, in his commentary on the passage, said that even, a bad, even bad men, very bad, can be in a good frame, very good, when they are around the people who are bringing the gospel. And as long as this man followed, followed Philip, he seemed to be tracking. He believed the message, so it would appear. But he hadn't been changed in his heart. He was even baptized. He gave up being the sorcerer, at least for the moment. And he identified with the church through the act of baptism. He went under the water. He professed Christ with his mouth. He even must have at some point, to some extent, assented to the reality of what Philip was saying with his mind. But what he did not seem to do, by what we read, is to cherish the Lord in his heart. He was still seeking flesh-oriented things. He was awed by what Philip was doing. And he was overawed by what Peter and John were doing. Notice what happens as Peter and John join Picking up in verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, not just heard it, not just that it had been preached there, but that they accepted it, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. This is significant. So now that out here in Samaria, where there is hostility between Jews and Samaritans, they, they don't cross paths, the gospel is being accepted. So Peter and John go to these that they would consider to be half-breeds, half-brothers. They go out there to them, and they send Peter and John so that the apostolic authority would be carried out, that they could engage in teaching, that they could lead them, that they could connect the Samaritan believers and the Jerusalem believers, that there would be authority and unity and brotherhood brought to them. When they arrived in verse 15, they prayed for the new believers that, there might, that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This does not confirm the false indication or the false teaching that the Holy Spirit comes to us separate from salvation. But in this time of, of transition in the early church, and particularly in situations like this, we don't see it everywhere in the spread of the gospel in Acts, but when we do see it, there are specific reasons. And the manifestation of the Spirit, as we saw in Acts 2, seems to be in mind here. If we read the rest of the scriptures, and what Paul tells us later, all who receive Christ receive the Spirit of Christ. All who have Jesus have the Holy Spirit in them. That does not appear to be what we're talking about. Not the still small voice of God, not the personal presence of God with them, but the manifest glory of God in the acts of the Holy Spirit. And we see that a lot come up. So bear this in mind that what has not happened yet, they have believed, they have uh, uh, by all accounts here, received the Spirit of Christ. They've been joined to the church through the act of baptism. Now, through the apostolic authority of Peter and John, they come, lay hands on them, conferring the, the blessing and approval of the apostles. And in this act, they receive the Holy Spirit in powerful manifestations so that it would be recognized by all others where there might be this animosity between jews and samaritans there is a recognition now that hey wait a minute these guys belong to the same group they have received the same holy spirit we'll see something very similar happen later uh, as the gentiles outside of of jerusalem and judea and samaria outside of there receive the gospel and receive the holy spirit so as, back to what we were saying with, uh, with Simon's awe of God's messengers, when he sees what's happening here, um, we're in John 7, uh, 8, I'm sorry, I read the word John, I threw myself off, Acts chapter 8, verse 17, then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. 
when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, all right, buddy, here we go. He offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, of course he did. This is the guy that knows the power of celebrity. He's awed by the works that they're doing. He wants this power so that he can essentially continue in what he had been doing for some time, practicing sorcery. Simon does not appear to see a difference other than a different approach. He doesn't seem to see a significant, meaningful difference between the works of the apostles and the sorcery that he had performed before. Not ontologically. The real difference he's seeing is they're doing even greater stuff. And it's real. If I could get that. He is awed by the power of God's messengers. The Ethiopian, on the other hand, was convicted by the truth of God's message. In, in verse 30, Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This becomes a gospel conversation. It starts out as just, hey, I see you're reading something. What are you reading? Do you get it? Okay, I don't get it. Can you explain it? Absolutely, let's talk. You jump up, we have a conversation. Here's the passage the eunuch was reading in verse 32. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Now, if you've been with us for any length of of time, you immediately recognize that as Isaiah 53, because we've spent a lot of time in the last several months going back to Isaiah 53. This picture of the suffering servant in Messiah. This was a sticking point for the Jews in receiving Christ. Because the Messiah was to be celebrated. The Messiah was to be a victorious king. The Messiah could not possibly suffer and die. There's no way. That's not the picture we're looking at. The Ethiopian sitting with Philip, receiving the explanation, was able to connect the dots. A man of authority who sees here in this suffering servant something dramatically different. Verse 34, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who's the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. This eunuch was not impressed with signs and wonders. There's no mention of those at all. He didn't even see the signs and wonders. What happened was he saw the scriptures and he realized that Jesus the Messiah, as Philip was explaining it, Jesus the Messiah, the King of glory, putting on flesh, took my stripes on his back. He was crushed for me. The Ethiopian would recognize that it's our sins that put Jesus on the cross. And his first response is, i got to give him myself. And he chooses to be baptized. They stop the chariot and they do it. And and the Spirit takes Philip away to go preach elsewhere. But Simon and the Ethiopian both did the same thing in response. At least on the outside. They both saw the gospel and chose to be baptized. They both had the outer sign, the initiation rite of joining the church, identifying with the death and resurrection of Christ and His body. Only one of them actually was reborn. Dramatic difference between the two. Simon knew the power of celebrity, the Ethiopian knew the meaning of authority. Simon was awed by the power of God's messengers. The Ethiopian was convicted by the truth of God's message. He was convicted in that he saw his own sinfulness separating him from a holy God. That was particularly probably poignant for him. He's in Jerusalem as an Ethiopian to worship. Jews worship in Jerusalem. Those who worship Yahweh. Why would he be there? Perhaps he was a proselyte. Well, he couldn't actually have been a full proselyte because eunuchs were banned from that according to Deuteronomy 18. 
They couldn't enter the temple. They couldn't be a full part of, of uh, the nation's worship. They were recognized as being not whole. And God is holy and require perfection. So when Philip shares with him that there is a way that Jesus has torn the temple veil that all may enter in, that all, even those who are separated by the law from God, which is all of us, even though it was clear for him, it's all of us. That must have resonated with him. He, as a God-fearing Gentile, saw the truth of the Hebrew Scriptures. That's why he's searching in Isaiah. That's why he's in Jerusalem to worship. Now he's on his way back home. He's not apparently Jewish by birth, but Ethiopian. He can't fully join the people of Israel as a Jew. He can't worship in the temple, so he had to go to Jerusalem and worship as an outsider. And yet he still did. A man of authority who humbles himself enough to come and worship as an outsider. Now hearing there is a way that you can be one with God. Powerful impact, powerful conviction, not by powerful experiences and emotions, but by the truth of God's message. Let's wrap this up with some principles for us to look at today. We're going to take a look at true and false. Not a quiz, but just an indication. There is such a thing as a false conversion. There is such a thing as saying all the right things and not actually having Christ in you. Jesus gave a parable. <clears throat> Turn to the book of Matthew. I won't have you stay there long, but I want you to see it. You may want to keep it marked because we'll finish in Matthew in a few moments. Matthew chapter 13. You know what, I want to skip chapter 13. Let's go back to chapter 7. For the sake of time, for the sake of time, we're going to go back here. This is where we will we'll wrap up in a few moments, so I want to just go ahead and jump to it. Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 13. Jesus speaking. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. They look like sheep. They look like believers. Inside, they're anything but. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. The next verse is our memory verse for, th for today. It fits into the, the central context of what Jesus is saying here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He just said, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Do we not minister for you, God? Do we not go on short-term mission trips? Do we not give money to the poor? Did we not wear Christian t-shirts and have real-life bumper stickers on our cars and drink from something real podcast mugs? Lord, we've done all the things. I went to youth group. I went to Bible camp. 
I was in a Bible study when I was in college. I had a cross around my neck. Verse 23 is his response. And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus has called us to truth. He has always given this picture of the difference between truth and falsehood, what is comfortable and what is real, what is desirable to the flesh, and what is given by God's Spirit. In Matthew 13, you don't have to turn there, but Jesus tells us part of this parable uh, of of what the kingdom is like, that the kingdom of heaven, I'll read it for you, verse uh, 24 and following, Jesus told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. While everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect all the weeds, or first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat, bring it into my barn. Older translations will often refer to those weeds as tares. Tares are a type of, it's also called darnel, it's a type of like a rye grass that looks like wheat in its early stages, but it isn't. And so what Jesus is saying here is there are tares among the wheat, and you don't know the difference. But at the final harvest, it will become clear. And the great harvester or the harvesters here, as he refers to angels, at this great harvest, it'll get sorted out. And those who look like wheat but are not will be burned. And the true wheat will be gathered in. All right, to our points, we'll move quickly here. First off, that which appeals to the flesh is of the flesh. That which appeals to the flesh is of the flesh. In Romans 8, we learn that that the spirit and the flesh are in contrast. They're against one another. There's hostility. The mind that is governed by sinful flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God. It can't submit to God, which is why Jesus went so far as to say, no one can even repent. We can't even come to him until the Father draws them. It's not in us. But Simon is a picture of what we do today. Very often, we want ministry that appeals to the flesh. We want the coolest, the slickest, the best. We want everything to fit right, to look right, to be the right amount of time, to have just the right illustrations. We have churches today that are like rock concerts or big youth conventions, smoke, light shows, rock and roll, Preachers with squirt guns on stage. That's all fun and games. But we miss the point of the church. I think this is one of the reasons, this is me me, uh, giving you a little free insight here. I think this is one of the reasons so many youth ministries fail. They get big. They gain crowds, not unlike Simon gained crowds in Samaria. And we wonder why so many people, 7 out of 10 high school graduates, leave the church when they leave home. 7 out of 10. From your youth group who go off to college and they leave the faith. Now, three of them statistically will end up coming back at some point. But why? Why is it not taking root? 
when Jesus talked about the parable of the soils in Mark chapter 4, I think it was 4, it's in Mark, it's written down on your program. When Jesus talked about the, the parable of the soils, there were seeds that were sown that grew up quickly because the sh- soil was shallow. So when it was sunny and the rains fell and it was great, they grew up quickly. They didn't make it because they didn't have roots. That which appeals to the flesh is of the flesh. If you find a ministry that is overly concerned with trying to get you hooked with gimmicks, run. That which appeals to the flesh is of the flesh. The flesh is driven by the sensory things. Things that appeal to our five senses. Experiences, feelings, emotions. If you have preachers or musicians who are trying to manipulate your emotions, not, there's not that there's anything wrong with emotions or feeling. <laughs> I see the band here looking at me like I'm crazy because they know that I cry almost every time we get together. I'm a big baby. Brad Clark, I'm such a baby, the dolphins make me cry. But <laughs> as, we're, as we are going through this life, if we don't have roots... If all we have is experience appealing to the flesh, then the Spirit isn't taking hold in us. That's not a ministry that comes from the Lord. That which appeals to the flesh is of the flesh. Next, notice, God calls us beyond what is natural to what is real. God calls us beyond what is natural to what is real. What's natural? Sin. Romans 3.23, all of sin falls short of the glory of God. It's in us. Paul, a little later on in, in Romans 5, 6, 7, 6 and 7 in particular, shows this, this depth of it that all of us have sin that we inherited from Adam, and we can't even get away from it when we're writing Scripture like Paul. We're hooked, we're stained, we're corrupted. What is natural to us is a real problem because our natural selves, our flesh, are bound over to sin. That's true for all of us. We don't see clearly. We need the Holy Spirit to remove the scales from our eyes. And what the the Spirit does in us mortifies, puts to death, our flesh. I don't know if you recognize this or not, but there's nothing comfortable about mortification. There's nothing comfortable about dying. There's nothing comfortable when the Spirit comes in and your eyes are so used to darkness that that's all you know, you don't even realize it's dark anymore, and the bright holiness of God's glory shines into you. It's not comfortable. But God has called us beyond what is natural, what is real. The idea that I was just born this way Whatever my particular proclivity is, we use that a lot these days with LGBTQ uh, issues. But we've been saying the same thing forever. If it feels good, do it. This is just how I'm made. If God didn't want me like this, then God wouldn't have made me like this. But God didn't call us to be natural, to do what seems to come naturally. He called us to be supernatural, to belong to Him, to be saved and transformed by the Spirit in us. He calls us beyond what is natural to what is real. Next notice, finding life means dying to self. Finding life means dying to self. We're called to put to death the deeds of the, of the flesh, the misdeeds of the flesh. These dark parts of us, the sinfulness that is natural to us, all of our urges unrestrained take us directly to hell. There is a way that seems right to a man, but it only leads to death. In Galatians, I'm going to turn there. You can join me or you can do it for your homework. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul gives us a picture of what that life looks like. Starting in 
Starting with verse 16, Paul says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. The Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you're not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, along with Simon's sorcery, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, referring to wild parties, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there's no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It's not a matter of repressing it, holding it in. It's not a matter of trying to to squash it down and I need some conversion therapy to try and fix it. There is no cure. There is no fix for your behavior. There is only death and rebirth in Christ. Those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Finding life means dying to self. Last, well, almost last. The the true and the false may appear to walk together, but their destinations are vastly different. The true and the false, speaking of our conversions, may may appear to walk together, but their destinations are vastly different. As Jesus said, with the, the tares and the wheat, just let them grow together. They might look the same difference but God knows and in the end it will come to fruition in fact that's our last point God knows those who are his truth will out God knows those who are his truth will out truth will become public it will out itself Shakespeare liked that particular thought it's an old saying it's an old thought and the truth hasn't changed Not everything is known in the moment, but eventually all will be revealed. You might think that that person next to you is a believer and they are not. You might think perhaps that they are not and they are, but ultimately their fruit will show and it will come out. You might doubt them because of your own prejudices. You may doubt them because they don't fit into your particular mold. But we will see in the long run the truth come out. The cream separates from the way. And as we see the acts of the flesh, of the sinful nature, come out in a person, there's an indicator of what kind of tree that is. See the fruit of the Holy Spirit come out in a person, there's an indicator of what kind of tree that is. But rest assured, what you and I may not know, God always knows. This is why we don't spend our time trying to sort out everybody's personal convictions. I will say with chagrin and pain that I've baptized many over the years who at this point are not on the road to heaven. They said all the right things, we had all the right conversations, but they were tares, not wheat. But it's not my job to pull up the tares just to continue to sow, to continue to do all I can to develop the wheat for God to harvest because it's His field. The Lord knows who are His, and the truth will out. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What is the will of the Father? Is it keeping the law? No, the Scripture is pretty clear about that. 
The law gives us a picture of how far we are away from the will of the Father. But nobody's saved or made right by keeping the law, largely because we can't. What is the will of the Father? The fruit of conversion is what we're talking about. When, when Jesus says, you're going to say, Lord, Lord, but you're not one of mine. He's not saying that doing the will of the Father causes you to be converted. He's saying that when you are converted, you will do the will of the Father. It's the fruit, not the root. What's the first thing that we can see? The greatest command. We read it earlier in Deuteronomy. Jesus uh, said it in Matthew 22. What's the greatest command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he went so far as to say the second is like it, expresses it. You know that you're doing the first well when you're showing it by doing the second, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. This is the will of the Father. This is what Christians do. Simon did not love the Lord more than he loved the power. He loved the power of the Lord. If we're going to do the will of the Father, if we're going to belong to Him, if you want to know which one you are, you need to let go of all the trappings and give everything to Him. What is the will of the Father? 2 Peter 2.9 says, it's the will of the Father that all should come to repentance. You want to know if you're doing the will of the Father? Turn from your way to His way. Repentance. Romans 10.9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... Remember, there's a difference between confession and profession. If I speak out with my mouth what is in my heart, and my heart believes that, he, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if I do that and I am saved, it will show up in Romans 12, 1 and 2, as I make myself a living sacrifice. In other words, I'm not living for me anymore. Like Paul said in Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live but Christ living in me. You make yourself a living sacrifice. And you don't let yourself be pushed into the mold of the world anymore. Instead, you're transformed from the inside out by the Holy Spirit as you renew your mind with God's Word. And then you will know and you will cling to God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Understand that Saving faith involves a confession of the heart, not merely a profession of the mouth. Not everybody who wears the jersey is on the team. Make sure that you're on the team. Don't worry about trying to pull out tears. Somebody else's walk is not your, your job. They answer to God for themselves. But make sure that you're not going through the motions of saying with your mouth something that your heart does not believe. We need to see Christ as most precious. When we cling to Him, we are truly saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we close out our service today, it is our prayer that You would change our hearts. That You would clean out those dirty places that we've held back. Father, we pray that You would cause us to be like Christ. That You would change us from the inside out, that our, our worship would be more than songs, more than words. It would be a surrender to You. Ah, Lord, you know we don't do it perfectly. None of us do. Teach us, however, to own our dependence on you. To recognize our sinfulness and our frailty. And to turn all of it over to you, trusting that you are good. Father, help us not to be constantly chasing after experiences or special knowledge. Demonstrative powers. Rather, Lord, help us to be convicted by the truth of your message, of the good message that you loved us so much that you sent your Son to die for us. Lord, make us those who do your will, 
from the very depths of our souls, choosing you above all else. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close today, we're going to go into a week that will cause us the temptation of living for others. May you remember as you go to live for an audience of one. As we die to ourselves, we find life. And it's my prayer that each person hearing this would find real life in Christ. A life that isn't on the outside of profession of the mouth but comes from the inside out as a confession of the heart. Go in peace.